welcome to another Queer Conversation episode brought to you by Lotto Production. My name is Silke Bader. Despite progress in breast cancer care over the past decades, gaps and inconsistencies in the experiences of treatment and care still exist for many people. Breast Cancer Network Australia is committed to making sure that services are inclusive, welcoming and safe for members of the LGBTQI plus communities and the support people. As part of this commitment, BCNA has developed a range of new resources to provide LGBTQI plus people affected by breast cancer with the information and support they need throughout the different stages of their treatment and care. Today I'm joined by Professor Jane Usher and couple Mel and Ricky. Mel was diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer in 2016 at age 36 and Ricky was Mel's primary carer. Professor Jane Usher has been working on research on gendered health since she started her PhD in 1983. Her research has been focusing on LGBTQI health as well as exploring gender and sexuality in cancer survivorship. Her current funded projects include an ANROS funded project on sexual violence and transgender women, sexual health of migrant and refugee women, and an ANROS funded project on the impact of complex sexual abuse on women. Over to you, Jane. Well, I've been leading um, a, a large scale study called the Out With Cancer Study, which is looking at the LGBTQI community experiences of cancer and cancer care. And the reason we did this is because we know from previous research that LGBTQI people have higher rates of distress and they have lower rates of cancer screening. And there is some evidence that um, lesbian identified cisgender women and gay and bisexual men are actually have higher risks of cancer because of lifestyle factors like drinking and smoking and sometimes obesity. But what there's a real gap in knowledge about experiences of cancer in terms of the LGBTQI communities. We don't know how many LGBTQI people with cancer there are in Australia because cancer registries don't collect this sort of data, which is a really big anomaly. And it, our community has been described as an invisible diversity and a marginalised population in terms of cancer care. So I'm really happy to be able to be on this podcast today and also to be here with Mel and Ricky who can talk about their experience of cancer and of caring for a um, person with cancer. So what we did is this study, it was funded by the Australian Research Council, which is basically the government. And it took us years to get the funding, but we did. Um, and it's actually, we've actually surveyed and it, over 650 LGBTQI people with cancer or who are carers with cancer. So that's actually the biggest study internationally to date uh, looking at this issue. And we've also surveyed and interviewed healthcare professionals about working with the LGBTQI community. And what we found is that of our whole population of, of people with cancer that we looked at, and that's across genders, across sexuality, across cancer types, we found that over 40% had high or very high distress. And that's compared to about 7 to 10% in the general cancer population. So this is a potentially high risk population, a potentially vulnerable population. But 60% of people didn't have high rates of distress. So I think one of the things that might be good to talk about in the podcast today is what's associated with distress and what we can do to help people so they're not distressed. And I know Mel and Ricky have got some good points in terms of their own experience that they can talk to us about. So one of the things we found is that the people who were highest distressed were younger. So what we describe as adolescents and young adults, so people between 15 and 39. And I think Mel and Ricky, you're sort of just on the cusp of going into older, unfortunately. Yep, yep. <laughs> you're, you're, you're young older. <laughs> Um, we also found that trans and non-binary people were also at higher risk of distress than mm. cisgender people. And those who identified as queer and bisexual were actually at higher risk of distress than people who identified as lesbian, gay or homosexual. And what we found, if we looked at the factors that predicted distress, and we say, okay, you're, you know, what, what, what are the factors in the mix that might cause you to be distressed? One of the big factors was discrimination in life. So people who'd experienced discrimination in life and discrimination in cancer care. And also people who felt that cancer had impacted on how they saw themselves as a man or a woman or a non-binary or trans person. So their gender identity. And if it impacted on their um, sexual identity in terms of how they saw themselves in terms of a sexual being. 
And also people who had low social support were more distressed. And that's something you see in the general cancer um, area. But one of the things I'd just like to highlight, and I want to talk about the positives, but just to think about discrimination, 85% of the people in our study said they discriminate, they'd experienced discrimination in life because of being LGBTQI, so because of being queer or lesbian or trans or non-binary. And 45% of our sample experienced discrimination in cancer care, which is actually really shocking because of being LGBTQI. And what we found was that when we asked people what's the most difficult thing about being queer or being lesbian or being trans or non-binary in terms of having cancer, people said disclosing identity was the most difficult aspect of cancer mm -hmm. care. So disclosing that you were trans or disclosing that you were a lesbian and people were really anxious about hostility from healthcare professionals. Um, is it safe? Um, when can I do it? How can I do it? And we had one of the things we did in the study, and, and Mel and Ricky had just told me actually as we came, as we met each other properly today, that they took part in the study, which is great. We actually asked people to take photographs of their experiences. And one of our participants took a photo of a tunnel. And when she described what was this tunnel, she said, in this tunnel, it's mostly safe, but it's like walking on an area with landmines. And you can walk through it fine for most of your the people you meet, they'll be professional and inclusive, but you've always got to be cautious. You don't know if you're going to step on a landmine, you have to walk gingerly, and this is what it means to navigate the health system as a lesbian woman. I don't know, Mel and Ricky, is this something you felt when you were navigating cancer care? Wow. Um, <laughs> probably not to that extreme, I think. Not you. Yeah. No, I do. <laughs> yeah. I think for me, I was just you know, so in it because I was obviously the one with the cancer. So I was focusing on what I needed to do and what I could do um, and just brought Rick to everything and didn't even ask if Rick was allowed, just kind of went, <laughs> this is my partner, Ricky. Um, so that was kind of my disclosure um, and just made sure that at every opportunity that Rick was involved in it and it was clear from the get-go that Rick was one of the decision makers in this process like we were doing this together mm. it was we always sort of you know had a joke I guess during Mel's treatment of you know Mel was very much you know what do I need to do what do I need to focus on let's do it um you know so very much focused on the present what needed to happen and looking after herself through you know everything that she had to go through um I'm the warrior um always have been um so I think of the big picture and I think because of the, the work that I, I do as a community worker within the LGBTIQA plus community and having so many friends and colleagues within um, the local community here who have had some very negative general experiences within the health system, I went to panic mode and I thought, holy crap, you know, how are we going to navigate this as a couple? Um, you know, do we disclose, do we not? Um, at, at that stage, we'd been together for 15-ish, about 15 years. Um, so it's not even something I didn't want for us to have to go back in the closet and, and, and hide who we were. But at the same time, after that amount of time, you can't hide being a couple either. So, you know, the interaction between two people when it's been an intimate relationship relationship for so long is just second nature you don't even notice it so I admittedly you know that that um, photo that you described by one of the participants and her her description that was yeah I have to admit I really related to that um mm -hmm. for sure but I, I think it's interesting um you know what you're describing Mel that that you sort of went in there and it's like you know this is my partner um they're going to be part of this process and like it's it's not a, it's a given, it's not a question. Yeah, it's not up and, back, yeah. and I, I think that's actually a really good role model for how to deal with this situation because I think a lot of people said to us, look, I don't know how to do it. And if you've got a partner, it's slightly easier mm -hmm. because you can introduce a partner and you can say, this is my partner. Because one of the things we found when we talked to the healthcare professionals, a lot of people um, didn't know people were um, LGBTQI mm -hmm. and they assume everyone's straight and they assume everyone's cisgender. And even people, even healthcare professionals who want to be inclusive, they just make that assumption. And, you know, we can't be critical of people for that. We can try and educate. Um, mm. So it means that there is that moment when you have to somehow let them know 
that you're not heterosexual, you're not straight and you're not cisgender. And so saying, mm. yeah, this is my partner is a real cue for that. Um, it's harder for people who don't have a partner and they have to kind of navigate other ways of doing it. But it's interesting. Yeah. We found that actually only a quarter of the people in our study, um, so you know, less than 25% were out to all of the healthcare professionals that they mm. encountered in, in the cancer, the whole of their cancer experience. And quite a lot of people said, well, I'm out to some. Like it's relevant if it's my oncologist or if it's my GP or if hopefully you're out to your GP anyway. But it's, you know, someone who I'm going to see multiple times, but if it's someone taking a blood test or, you know, someone who's mm. just doing a scan, you know, you don't necessarily need to go through a whole disclosure thing because it's mm. it's hard work. It's like emotional work on top of dealing with cancer. And that's what a lot of people said to us. And, you know, I know that in my own life. I mean, I'm out in my life. But, you know, if you go into a new situation or, you know, doing talks and it's like I always situate myself in terms of, being a lesbian identified woman and having a wife and but you don't always sometimes people do react strangely and if you're mm -hmm. dealing with cancer as well that's hard and I think that's something that some healthcare professionals just don't get they don't if, if you're a straight person you don't necessarily know that it's hard um, yeah I, I, I guess it was for us to you, you're quite right for us it's quite not quite sorry it's probably a bit easier for us and for mel especially because we are we are a couple mel knows that i've you know i'm going to stand up for her if anything untoward was going to happen um and i think in the discussions we had initially before you even started having surgeries and, and treatment and stuff like that it was being clear um for both of us that i was mel's I guess next of kin or you know partner emergency contact whatever term we want to use so for any major decision that had to go to someone else if Mel wasn't able to make it I was that person um type thing we wanted to be very clear with any of the practitioners we encountered um you know it, it's a horrible thought to have when you're going through this stuff but we wanted to be very 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 clear but we do acknowledge yeah that we are I guess um we're very lucky, we're very privileged to be able to do that because we know for a lot of people that isn't definitely isn't the case. And did you ever have any negative experiences in terms of reactions from, um, you know, doctors or other clinicians that you talk to? No, um, the whole, through the, the sort of the cancer journey that we had over the 12 months primarily, um, there was not really any major negative experiences when whenever I brought Rick to appointments they were just like okay um this is who's in the room now um there wasn't really any kind of comments about it um and they were we actually went through fertility as well before mm -hmm. chemo just as a backup measure um and through that process Rick came to all the appointments um and we were having discussions about you know what happened if um, my eggs wanted to then go into Ricky at a later stage or anything um, and the practitioners were all sort of open to those sort of discussions so mm. yeah we, for us we were quite lucky and had a quite a positive experience yeah That's great. I, th I th kind of th I think I prepared myself for perhaps some negative reactions so um you know knowing that re the reality of it, of of it all is that it, it could happen so for them to go through and we, we did have a fairly smooth sailing um, experience was quite a relief um, mm. and I'm, I'm very thankful for it because going through cancer is, is incredibly stressful enough let alone you know having to worry about is someone going to say a, a ridiculous comment um, off the cuff without them you know deliberately wanting to be malicious or anything like that sometimes it might be a deliberate thing as well um, you know, they're, they're the things we shouldn't have to, to be second guessing when someone's going through, you know, really horrible treatment um, regime and, and multiple surgeries and all of that stuff. So, yeah. I think it is really important to, that, you know, that's why we're part of what we're doing as part of the studies, preparing um, practice guidelines for healthcare professionals and, you know, talking to healthcare professionals about using appropriate language and, asking yeah. people about what gender pronouns they want yeah. and including partners which is really important but you know unfortunately mm. we did find some people had negative experiences and you know one person said said to us when they um said that they were gay they found healthcare professionals shut down and felt like they were cold 
Um, and another person said when they talked to us said that they felt that they thought the healthcare professionals were uncomfortable and you know just mm. felt they were out of their comfort zone which actually some of the doctors and clinicians actually did say to us and they're really uh, what we found is a lot of the clinicians are anxious about getting it wrong saying oh you know I don't understand the language I don't you know, understand the acronyms um, and, and actually interestingly the, the clinicians were less comfortable treating um, trans and non-binary people and people with an intersex variation than they were treating, you know, lesbian, queer, bisexual identified people. Mm -hmm. So there's a kind of, I think, greater comfort and knowledge about um, people who, yeah, people who are cisgender than there are with trans and non-bi, not intersex people. Yeah, that that doesn't surprise me with any of the of the reports I've come across and read. And and you know, the in my work role, I, I do deliver workplace training, and that's something we often talk about with the people doing the training with is that you know the, oh, that's right you know the the lgb part of the community i think is something that yeah it is more well known and more aware of and people do tend to to be a bit more comfortable about um in the i the t the q and the a it tends to be something that is um becoming more increasingly present within the community which is fabulous but it also means that you know, dealing with that lack of knowledge and awareness from practitioners um, within the health system and, and many other services and, and the general population too, which is really, um, yeah, really, really sad and worrying for them. And it's interesting, I've, I've actually been, you know, reading the accounts today and, you know, over the last week of the people who identify as trans and non-binary and I think that that's a group that is more vulnerable in terms of discrimination in life and being excluded in life as well as um, potentially in cancer care and yeah. often people feeling excluded from a broader LGBTQI community and feeling that they're, they're seen as other and seen as different and I think sometimes yeah. there's a notion that we all support each other but we don't necessarily and so I yeah. think it's, it's really important to be aware of that vulnerability of some people. Absolutely and I, I guess too for a lot of um, trans and non-binary folk um, with a gender diverse community as as well but also those with intersex variations they've they've already experienced a multitude of, of trauma within the health system and with practitioners and things like that too so to then have to go through possibly go through that all again right, it's it's not surprising that they are overrepresented in the in the data yeah and i think for young people too i mean i think you know we're we're i'm, I'm definitely in the older adult bracket um, and you two are in the just on the cusp, so you can. Yeah, we are. <laughs> but I think I think you know you've been. To, you said you've been together for you know over fifteen years and more than that now. And um, you know I've been with my wife for twenty years, and and you you have a confidence in your relationship and who you are as a person. But if you're a young person just coming out and you might not be in a relationship, you might be getting hostility from your parents who don't accept you. That's very very different. So I think that's something that's really, you know, we need to be sensitive about and and. Um, to provide support and to provide information for those people who might be a bit vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And I think it's interesting in our study, what we found is that the older lesbian identified cisgender women were actually the ones who were more likely to be out to healthcare professionals and more likely to report a positive response because of the sorts of things actually you two have described, going in there and saying, oh, this is who I am, being really matter of fact about it, I expect you to treat me positively, not necessarily saying that outright, but you know, by your actions. And actually, the doctors and clinicians, a lot of them do respond to that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that, you know, I think that's one of the things that we're wanting to do in, in relation to BCNA. And that one of one of the things that's come out of the study is actually developing resources for people with LGBTQI, people with cancer, with breast cancer, to help them in that cancer journey to address issues that are of particular concern. Um, and one of the resources we developed is around disclosure about how to come out, when to come out, what's the implication of not coming out, because um, we've talked quite a bit about, you know, disclosure being hard, but if you don't disclose, it means you feel invisible. Um, you're having to pretend that you're either cisgender or that you're straight. And it means that the healthcare professionals you're dealing with actually think you are straight. So they're going to talk about, you know, you know they'd be saying, oh, how's your husband? Or can you bring your husband into treatment? And that, you know, that's not, that doesn't feel good. People say that that makes them feel, you know, awful and inauthentic in themselves. And it also means if there's specific information that people want around their sexuality or their experience of their bodies, 
it can be very cis heteronormative. So we mm. found quite a lot of um, people who had breast cancer, particularly if they were non-binary or trans, were actually quite happy to have a mastectomy. Um, and not that having mastectomy is the same as having um, is, is is actually go, is the same as going flat in other contexts. But actually, the, the experience of the body can be quite different from somebody who is a cisgender person with breast cancer. Um, and we also had some people talk to us about having sexual changes after cancer and having um, being encouraged by the doctors to use vaginal dilators when they were saying, actually, that's not an issue in terms of my sexual practices. Mm -hmm. So really wanting information that's quite specific to our experience of our bodies. And that might be different across communities. So. I think that's why it's really it, coming out can be quite quite an important thing. Mm. Breast Cancer Network Australia, who is launching on the twenty first of March, the, the resources my journey, and mm -hmm. obviously this is what the discussion here is about. I I was wondering, Mel and Ricky, if I don't know, have you had a chance to look at what um, uh, what will be available on those resources, and what is it that you wished you would have had? Which you didn't have. It was you. Yep, that's it. <laughs> yeah, so I was part of the uh, I was part of the advisory group, so I, I have seen all the materials. Um, I think Rick did look at a, a couple of them over my shoulder, but hasn't had as detailed a look. Mm. Um, but I I think it was it would be good to have just to be seen in the materials. Mm -hmm. I know when we were looking through the resources that we were provided at the start of the process that um, you got this whole pack of stuff and for some of it, it was kind of almost neutral. It didn't kind of mention partners. It just mentioned partners and things instead of husband automatically. Um, but there were other areas. It was, I think there was about one paragraph in one mm -hmm. book or something that was pretty much the entire queer content to the resources. Yeah. Um, so just being able to see these resources that have, you know, being launched that um, cover a spectrum of um, information, but also um, a spectrum of representation within the community. Um, so they didn't just create them for, you know, um, lesbian women. Um, I know that they've established resources for intersex, um, non-binary, trans, they're all sort of covered within the material. So I think it's a great step to have that um, and just as, you, as I said just to be seen and know that oh look here I am actually in the materials maybe I feel a bit more comfortable now sharing this with my practitioner because here is an example of what has happened in the past. So. Yeah um, along with being the, the warrior out of the two of us I'm also the reader and the researcher so um, as Mel said when her journey first started I was the one that went to BCNA and I'm like, right, what, what have you got? What materials, resources have you got that we can read um, to sort of prepare us for what might be ahead? And there was, there's, there's a huge amount in the, in the My Journey pack. Um, but Mel, as Mel said, I, I found, I think, one page out of everything that referred to LGBTI, QA plus communities, which I was kind of surprised and, and, and happy to see that it was there. But also I thought, well, there needs to be a lot more because we already knew that our experience would be a little bit different in terms of or the stress we were already experiencing about disclosure. Um, but our rights as a couple, you know, as a de facto couple at that point in time, we weren't aware of what our rights were and if we were protected, if something, you know, untoward happened to Mel. Um, you know, the situation has changed. We're now legally married. So that's we know we are covered by law. But for those who aren't married, what's the situation for them type thing? Um, I guess for us at the time too, we were trying to connect with peers, other people who had gone through cancer as well. Um, I found I hunted all over, you know, the metropolitan area for a group that I could connect with um, as an LGBTIQA plus person, but there wasn't anything. And online there wasn't anything. It was, there was just nothing and, and it was quite isolating I guess Mel was able to find some groups that she was able to go to which I was really relieved for that weren't necessarily about. queer focused no. just breast cancer groups but. yeah yeah um which was fantastic as you know to connect with others who had gone through the same thing it was a very similar thing sorry mm -hmm. um but yeah no there was there was I wish, yeah, I even now I wish there was a group that was, you know, for LGBTIQA plus people to be able to talk Partners. to each other. 
a partner, sorry. <laughs> well, both people, yeah, for people and for their partners as well, because I'm not going to rock up to a um, partners group that is full of men, um, you know, for their wives and, and girlfriends going through it because I wouldn't feel safe. I honestly wouldn't feel safe going. I think lots of people that took part in the study said that, and that was a really big thing, people saying that just being feeling visible in resources, as you've both said. And in fact, we've done an audit of all of the cancer resources in Australia, which has been huge. And there are very, very few um, acknowledgements of the queer people, of LGBTQI people, um, very few images. So all the images tend to be of heterosexual couples and white, actually. There's getting to be a bit more inclusion of cultural diversity. Um, but really, it's it, we, we are invisible as a community in terms of the cancer context. But I think BCNA, are, we actually did an audit of all of their resources as well. And yeah. um, they were already on board as part of the study. So they were open to having this. And I think we're um, wanting to develop their own resources anyway. So they're actually going to be leaders in the pack in terms of having tailored resources and we've been able to develop them from the study findings and use the voices of people in the study in terms of quoting them and look at all those sorts of issues you know look at legal issues look at palliative care issues look at issues for partners look at issues in terms of how to deal with bodily changes how to disclose and um, the fact that we, we've developed them with a whole range of community partners and then the BCNA advisory group that you're both part of or Mel's part of is um, have also looked at the resources so it means it's actually coming it's really had community input into it it's not a whole bunch of academics in a well, it's not really an ivory tower in Campbelltown where I work but um, a metaphorical ivory tower developing these these are actually the voices of people in the community in these resources and I think it is about visibility is really important because that was one of the things that really came out of the study of people saying we feel invisible and then that makes people feel anxious and not know what's going to happen. Whereas I think that's what we're trying to do with this this research and with partnering with organisations like BCNA um, mm. is to actually increase visibility and say, look, we're out there. So I think one of the things that worries me is that healthcare professionals say, oh, well, I've never treated somebody who's LGBTQI. And I always say to them, well, yes, you have. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, the odds of you never having done that is almost impossible, but you just Correct. didn't know. And you probably just didn't give them space to tell you. Or I think one of the other worrying things is that clinicians don't think it's important because they say, well, I treat everyone the same. And actually that isn't about inclusion. And it means it puts all of the onus on the patient to go through the disclosure process, all yeah. of that anxiety, and they don't know how you're going to respond. Yeah, so, yeah. exactly. And, that, and that's the same thing we talk about in the workplace training we do is, and if, even within my workplace is, it's not about treating everyone the same. It's, it's acknowledging the experience that someone's already had before they even walk in the door. You know, how do you indicate that you're a safe person to disclose to? Um, that they can trust, they can relax and focus on their health and well-being and recovery and, and everything that is involved with that. Um, so they've, you know, there has to be a bit of work from I think the practitioners in the health system in um, ensuring that these services and these treatments are, you know, a, a safe place for for LGBTIQA plus people. And and Jane, how long has the study uh, has gone on for? Um, well, we're in our fourth year in terms of we're writing it up at the moment and producing the resources, but it took us about five years to get the funding. So I feel like I've been doing it for the last 10 years of my life. And I kind of, when I when I wake up in the middle of the night, I'm thinking about it and I'm sort of very much living it. But I think it's, um, I don't normally big note myself and say what I'm doing is important, but I think this is actually a really important study because I think it's it's so connected to the community uh, and mm. it is so much about giving voice to the community and giving voice to people who actually have been unheard and made invisible um, and actually giving people the confidence that they can actually interact with the health system, that they can go through the cancer journey equal to anybody else who's out there and have our needs as, as LGBTQI people acknowledged and where we are different or where we may um, be more vulnerable or more sensitive or we may have a different gender partner um, actually just being treated equally but also you know acknowledging the difference and I think mm. yeah Ricky what you said you do in your training that's that's great I'll have to talk to you about how you do your training in your workplace I think can help <laughs> <you> <laughs> <to> <laughs> <that training. laughs> 
has the uh, the research been been taken up by other organizations do you find that they're very receptive um i actually think people are very receptive i think this is a good time for for this research it's very timely um you know, we started it before we had marriage equality. We started it before we had the religious discrimination bill and the kind of backlash against marriage equality. And I think there's a lot of public awareness about LGBTQI issues. And even though I, I would say hopefully it's a minority who are um, hostile and discriminatory, I think there's a lot of goodwill, particularly in the health system. And people want to know, they want to be educated. All of the healthcare professionals that we talked to wanted more education. Um, and I think that it's it's actually we find we we have a number of partner organisations so Cancer Council, Prostate Cancer Foundation, Canteen they're all working with us to create resources and you know BCNA of course for, for breast cancer um, we've also Acon a part of our, our team and the LGBTI Health Alliance and we've actually been able to have input into their submission to Cancer Australia. Uh, for the new cancer plan and that's the submissions actually went in last week and actually making a real case for how cancer australia needs to acknowledge lgbtqi people and the first thing is we need to be counted the cancer mm. registries need to count actually count us in terms of our sexuality and our gender diversity um so hopefully that's something that's going to change but i think there is an openness to this uh, but i think it's something that has to be you know we have to keep speaking about it and be confident in speaking about it and actually, I think part of that is acknowledging the difficulties that some people have had in the health system. And I know mm. we want this to be a positive story so that people are not distressed. But I think mm. it's also important to point out that not everybody has the experience that Mel and Ricky had mm. and that we need to address mm. that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think sharing a, a wide range of, of stories and experiences that people have had um, from both sides, you know, as, as a patient, but also as practitioners, I think is, is going to be really important. Um, you know, I was, I was so excited when I saw this, this, um, the research project, uh, appear on, on my newsfeed on, on Facebook and, and through my work emails and things like that too. So, you know, thank you, Jane, for, for persisting with getting the, the funding. It is in very, very needed, um, definitely. And I, I know there's, so many wonderful practitioners out there um, who are friends and colleagues here in here in South Australia. But it's um, yeah, I know there's lots. There's more people now that are wanting to do do good than there are those who who perhaps aren't um, quite on board yet. The, the only other thing possibly to mention is, um, as I mentioned, we a lot of participants in the study took photographs of their experience, and we're actually going to be putting together an exhibition of those photographs as part of the study outcomes and we'll have that both as a physical exhibition and an online exhibition and that's a really good way of capturing people's experiences um, in a visual way in a simple way and some of the photos are incredibly moving some of them are about difficulty but what's really interesting is a lot of them are about support and that's support from friends from chosen family from partners and from broader LGBTQI community. So there is actually a really positive story as part of this as well. And I think it's important to acknowledge that. Mm. Okay. Well, um, thank you, Jane, Mel and Ricky for joining us today at our studio. Um, and again, you're doing great work, um, Jane. That's that research that you've done. And as um, Mel and Ricky said, going for this funding and mm -hmm. um, keeping up this work for five years is amazing. Um, Mel and Ricky, um, all the best for your journey forward. Yeah. And, yeah, and keep that yeah. when DNA launched their resources, Mel hasn't said this yet, but, <laughs> but we are part of the, the new photography stock that BCNA have taken as part of their resources. So you will see our faces pop up again with those. But Mel um, also did a podcast as part of the BCNA um, you know, new collection of resources about her journey too. There's a couple of queer podcasts. Yeah, there, so. yeah. There's, there's lots. Looking really forward great. to all going live. Yeah. What's the name of the podcast? <laughs> Cancer through a queer lens, I think. Beautiful. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, yeah, maybe yeah, I, and I did a podcast with um, Natalie House, who I don't know if you guys know Natalie. She was um, she's a BCNA consumer rep, and she was on our stakeholder group. So Natalie mm. and I podcast um talking about the study and natalie also talked about her own experiences of breast cancer as a, as a lesbian identified woman thank you for sharing this with us today to find out more head to bcna.org.au or sign up to bcna's free resources 
myjourney at myjourney.org.au, also available as an app. Thank you. Thank you.